Hello, everyone. I hope that you're doing well, and thanks for joining us. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Cindy Nguyen, who is a wonderful colleague, friend, and a human being. Um, Dr. Nguyen earned her PhD in history at UC Berkeley and specializes in the history of Vietnam, Southeast Asian print culture, and libraries. Currently, she's a postdoctoral fellow in international humanities in the Department of History and the Kogut Institute for Humanities at Brown University, where she teaches innovative virtual reality-based courses on Southeast Asian history. In her book, Manuscript, uh, Reading and Misreading, The Social Life of Libraries in Colonial Viet and colonial control in Vietnam, 1865 to 1958, examines the cultural and political history of libraries in Hanoi and Saigon uh, from the French colonial period through to the decolonization of libraries through the lens of cultural imperialism, national legitimacy and social practices of public reading. Uh, she has presented her scholarship internationally, including um, in the US, Vietnam, and Singapore. And her essay, um, The Social Life of the Hanoi Central Library, Reading Cultures in Public Space, 1919 to 1941, won the Association for Asian Studies, uh, Patana Kitiarsa Southeast Asian Council Prize in 2020. And in addition to being a scholar, Dr. Nguyen is also a digital humanist, an artist, a poet, a translator, a filmmaker, a publisher, a feminist, and a refugee. Uh, she seamlessly weaves her uh, these dimensions into provocative and beautiful multimedia work, including short films that meditate on intergenerational transmissions of language, love, and loss. Dr. Nguyen is currently working on a poetic documentary film on, language, on the language of Vietnamese refugee remembrance and history. And since this brief introduction does not do justice to the breadth and depth of Dr. Nguyen's intellectual and creative endeavors, please do visit her website. Um, and I'll drop those in the chat for you for more information and access to her wonderful work. Uh, today, Dr. Nguyen's talk is titled The Politics of Good Reading, Libraries and the Public in Late Colonial Vietnam. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nguyen. Thank you so much for the introduction. It, it's truly an honor to be introduced by Glenn, who um, is, is really um, just makes me remember all the different types of collaborative work that we've done together and really to just to celebrate the different types of things that I've done in terms of my pedagogy and research. So thank you again, Glenn. Um, I want to also take this opportunity to thank you, Glenn, Eric, and Chris for inviting me to be part of this Brown Bag series. I truly appreciate this opportunity to be in virtual intellectual community with all of you and to share this work in progress. I very much look forward to the Q&A to elaborate on this work as well as a larger book manuscript. So I'm just gonna take a second to set up share screen and not multitask while doing this to make sure everything's good. So again, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Cindy Nguyen, a cultural historian of Vietnam libraries and print culture. Today's talk, I will first discuss the main research questions and interventions of my book manuscript titled This Reading. I'll share an excerpt from the book focused on the case study of the 1930s to 1940s book wagons Bibliobus project in Cochin, China, Southern Vietnam. And I'll conclude with a discussion on the book's chapter's scope and major contributions to the field. So my book project titled This Reading examines the cultural and political history of libraries and print control in Vietnam from 1865 to 1958. I analyze the changing mission of colonial libraries, the hybrid of state documentation and a public space for self-directed education and social life. Focus primarily on the state central library in Hanoi um, and the coach in China library in Saigon shown here in this slide. This book advances a two-part argument on the history of libraries and current control in Indochina, which today consists of Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. First to build libraries is to build the state Libraries legitimize the authority of the state as infrastructures of symbolic modernity, print control, and documentary heritage. Second, library users also shape the everyday mission and social function of the library beyond these hegemonic aspirations of colonial and post-colonial states. This study demonstrates how builders and users articulated a meaning of public through the functions of the colonial state libraries to serve its readers, to preserve documentary heritage and to operate as a broader instrument of public education and moralization 
This two-part argument reveals the significance of the library as an institution of state building, print control, and public reading culture. The, this book is the first more comprehensive history of the library in Southeast Asia. The narrative is bookended by two formative events, the founding of the Cochin China French Colonial Library in 1865, which was the first colonial state public library in Indochina, and the centralization of the National Library of the New Republic of Vietnam in 1958, South Vietnam. So this chronology challenges externally defined chronologies such as 1945, World War II, 1954, the end of the First Indochina War, and completely offers this new frame of reference and understanding into processes of colonization and decolonization and creation of post-colonial nation states from the perspective of Vietnam. In terms of source material, I primarily use newspapers, official archives, reader statistics in Vietnam and France. My top-down and bottom-up analysis of library builders and users contributes to the findings of the colonial state, libraries, public and urban space, knowledge curation, and print culture. With attention to labor, access, and space, the book sheds light on the politics of gender and race in libraries, as well as its legacies in post-colonial nation building in Vietnam. So as a way to illuminate the arguments of the book manuscript, I will focus on the specific case study of the mobile library wagon project in Cochin, China, South Vietnam in 1930s to 1940s. On March 1936, the first bibliobus or mobile library book wagon in Indochina began its journey through nine provinces in Cochin, China. The library wagon circulated 832 French and Vietnamese books of popular literature, politics, morality, and science from the Cochin, China Saigon Library. Every two months, the book wagon toured through the nine provinces, lending books to Vietnamese and French readers. A Vietnamese driver and secretary from the Cochin, China Library accompanied the wagon. The book wagon encountered many delays and accidents. For example, on September 1st, 1937, on the way from Bazia to Bien Hoa, the book wagon struck a tree stump when swerving to avoid hitting a seven-year-old girl who was in the road. The accident severely damaged the wagon, delaying the trip for one month while the vehicle underwent extensive repairs. The Bibliobus book wagon continued its route on November 15, 1937, from Saigon through the Western Mekong Delta region following this schedule. So in this schedule here, you see that um, this is the first mobile book wagon after its repairs, departing from Saigon. Note the limited operating hours of the mobile wagon at each stop, as well as the central location in front of administrative offices, schools, and hospitals. Over the course of the year, the mobile book wagon served a total of 10,000 readers. Due to the success of the first book circuit on December 1937, a second mobile book wagon traveled through eight other provinces of Cochin, China, Bac Liu, Cam Mo, uh, Rakya, uh, Tien, Zhou Dok, Beinin, Go Gong, Bazia, and Cap Saint Jacques. The second mobile wagon served a total of 21,500 readers over the course of one year. The story of the mobile book wagon seems particularly ambitious and curious. Why did the governmental and public Cochin China Library circulate its valuable collections to the countryside? What books moved from the urban center of Saigon to the provinces? Who were the readers and what did they check out? A closer examination of this peculiar project sheds light on the geographic and symbolic extension of the colonial state into the countryside through physically bringing, quote, good reading to the people. Good reading, I argue, was a changing political, moral, and literary concept advanced by French and Vietnamese government administrators, librarians, publishers, writers, as well as readers. This talk offers three discoveries. First, it reveals how high-level administrators and the Indochina Library Director advanced a cultural propaganda project to disseminate good reading as didactic, politically safe, and vulgarizing reading matter to the countryside through book wagons. Secondly, I show how this state-initiated book wagons project intersected with the development of Vietnamese reading public actively enmeshed in global translated literature in French and Vietnamese, as well as a growing body of Quoc Mu, a Romanized script, Vietnamese literature. Thirdly, I reveal a vibrant Vietnamese public sphere who debated the role of good reading and called for the development of Quoc Mu library collections for the larger Vietnamese public. My primary research question is the following, what role did the official state libraries such as the Cochin China Library, and then also the Hanoi Center Library, play within this larger landscape of print culture and reading public in the late colonial period? This talk on the Bibliobus mobile wagon project, as well as a larger book manuscript, 
points to the mechanics, the discourse and everyday practice of the library to fulfill its role as an official government institution, a resource of public education, and a cultural space for the practice of collective responsibility, urban civility, and public reading. From 1928 to 1930, the French colonial administration drew inspiration from the existing Bustaka State sponsored publishing bureau, distribution office, and library system in the Dutch East Indies, today Indonesia. Governor General of Indochina, Pierre Pasquier, commissioned extensive studies on the Dutch East Indies publishing and popular libraries project, seeking to implement a similar project in French Indochina. Emile Verac, the director of the Office of Indigenous Publishing and the resident superior of, at the Resident Superior of Tonkin, North Vietnam, he studied the Bali Bustaka in Indonesia and evaluated the current state of publishing and print in Indochina. Verac argued that Vietnamese publications perpetuated dangerous criticisms of French colonization and civilization. He quotes, Vietnamese literary production is struggling in anarchy and drags itself into insignificance. Apart from some republications of old poems or ancient moral guides, a small number of serious works, the majority of Vietnamese print criticizes us, the French, and speaks poorly of our civilization. Praising the Dutch East Indies, Veyrock argued that the Bali Pustaka created libraries and schools, police stations, hospitals, and instituted an office of publishing which produced and distributed good reading throughout the country. Colonial administrators such as Bayrak were keenly aware and threatened by the rise and influence of anti-colonial sentiment and political organizing in Indochina in the 20s and the 30s. In his essay, The Program for the Recovery of the Public Spirit, from his report, Bayrak elaborated on the colonial administration's anxieties over Vietnamese radicalism. Bayrak described the existing threat of revolutionary political ideas, Chinese influence, anti-French sentiment among a growing generation of dangerous young urban Vietnamese radicals eager for change, as seen in this slide. Bayrak called attention to the pervasiveness of Bolshevik and anti-French agitation amongst urban Vietnamese, especially students, workers, youth. The spirit of subversion undermined the Vietnamese family, corrupted the minds of young students, and could potentially permeate into the countryside. Within this context of increased radical radicalism, the colonial administration developed new strategies to control the quickly spreading evil of insubordination amongst outspoken Vietnamese. Barack believed that carefully crafted and widespread propaganda messages could counter the rising political anti-French and revolutionary sentiment in the Vietnamese urban youth. As seen in this slide, Veyrac created this indirect propaganda strategy where he emphasized the importance of the rural population, the group that he considered not only the humble true people of Indochina, but also the population most vulnerable to the political ideologies propagated by urban intellectuals. Virak suggested two effective methods of indirect propaganda, propaganda through action and propaganda by imagery and appearance. This essay concludes with an attached list of European works to translate to Vietnamese. Bayrak argued that the best works to translate for Vietnamese readers should include French popular literature from the Middle Ages, such as Tales of Perrault, La Fontaine's fab Fables, Renard's novels, moral and educational works, as well as proverbs. This list focused primarily on instructional apolitical texts he called that could civilize and morally uplift Vietnamese readers. The colonial state saw a direct political interest in indigenous publishing and libraries to produce and disseminate a pro-colonial message. Iraq study is only one of the example of the extensive documentation from the colonial administration that show how control of publishing and libraries was essential as a propaganda tool for the colonial state. At the same time of this process with Iraq, the director of the archives and libraries, Paul Boudet, initiated efforts to create provincial libraries, a distribution network and book wagons or a bibliobus through the existing infrastructure of the state directorate library system in Hanoi and Saigon. I'll now discuss a bit of contextual background on the library system in Indochina and the role of Paul Boudet. The vision and organization of Indochina Library was deeply shaped by the first and only colonial era director, Paul Boudet. Paul Boudet graduated from the renowned Archives and Library School in Chartres in 1909 as an archivist paleographer. On November 30th, 1917, Boudet was appointed as director of the newly centralized Directorate of Archives and Libraries in Indochina which, um, which uh, sorry, in Hanoi. So that was based in Hanoi. Paul Boudet was also the head director of the Hanoi Central Library opened in 1919, which operated both as an extension of the Bibliothèque Nationale in France and as an Indochina State Library in the colonial capital of Hanoi. 
Palm Bay standardized, Palm Bay standardized technical and administrative policies for documentation in Indochina. Most importantly, Boudet defined the function and mission of a modern library based off of French libraries. He argued that encyclopedic libraries must assemble the best works of all levels of knowledge in orderly, stable, and comprehensive collections. A modern library followed French model of libraries, he argued, specifically the BNF, the Bibliothèque Nationale, to provide scientifically classified best works to the greater public. Boudet sought to implement these visions to all the regional libraries in Indochina, the Hanoi Central Library, the Cochin China Central Library, as well as the Phnom Penh Cambodge Library. Throughout the colonial period though, the vision and reality of the colonial library as modern encyclopedic and public often differed in, in, in practice. Many of these libraries such as the Cochin China Library in Saigon originated first as a government library to provide documentation, reference matter and reading leisure for French administrator and at times their wives who had relocated to Saigon. Yet by 1920s and 1930s, an increasing number of Vietnamese university students, commercial workers and researchers sought to access these valuable library collections. Furthermore, library administrators debated what type of good reading should be added to the library collection. Libraries encountered budget constraints to build collections and hire staff. They also ran out, often ran out of space for storage and offered a limited number of seats in the reading room as pictured here in the Cochin China Library, which was housed in the cramped government secretariat building together with the archives in Cochin China. In 1938, the reading room held a collection of 36,000 volumes. Although constrained by a limited number of 44 seats, the reading room was able to welcome over 133 readers each day. During 1938, the popular lending section recorded a total of 31,000 borrowers and 55,000 book loans. Since the founding of the Director of Archives and Libraries in 1917, Boudet had envisioned an expansive network of provincial libraries throughout Indochina. Inspired also by the Bali Pustaka in Indonesia, the Governor General Pierre Piasquet officially enlisted Boudet to research public libraries and book wagons around the world. On March 28, 1929, Paul Boudet wrote to the American Library Association office in Paris and requested documents to study American circulating book wagons and shipment service in order to develop a similar project in Vietnam. Boudet was particularly interested in the practical cost-efficient methods used by automobiles for the distribution of books. From here, it begins an extensive exchange of letters between Boudet and libraries from all around the world. Boudet received extensive replies and research resources from the ALA, the American Library Association in Paris, the office in Chicago, even the California State Library in Sacramento. American libraries shipped hundreds of recent pamphlets, legal documents, book catalogs, and newspapers for Boudet to study the organization of circulating libraries and book wagons in America. These resources explore topics such as the curatorial responsibility of librarians, the importance of literacy, and access to useful knowledge such as technology to our technical books. Boudet also wrote to the Metropolitan Library in Beijing in China, the Central Library in Baroda, India, to request information on their circulating libraries program. This points to the significant ways in which models for library development was a transnational process, not always stemming from metropole to colony. From these comparative library models, Boudet proposed his circulating library project, which consisted of the following, lending a French and Guknu, a Romanized Vietnamese, the popular script of spoken Vietnamese, books in the provinces, and the distribution of the provinces, to the provinces, these books and pamphlets published by indigenous writers under official control. Recognizing the high cost of this project, Boudet emphasized the potential of a circulating library system to provide the European indigenous population in the provinces a healthy leisure activity. Additionally, Boudet argued that the circulating library project could combat the spread of politically dangerous reading matter among Vietnamese readers, such as works inspired by Bolshevik propaganda pamphlets widely distributed in China, he says in this slide. Similar to Veyrac's proposal for counter propaganda initiatives, Boudet argued that circulating libraries could also combat the dangerous influence of Chinese revol revolutionary texts. This counter propaganda strategy sought to increase the availability of safe texts through state sponsored distribution, libraries, and publishing, in hopes that these texts would flood the Vietnamese print market. By making safe reading matter more plentiful, colonial administrators and Boudet hoped to compete with the popularity of illicit reading matter amongst Vietnamese. Throughout the 1930s, the Governor General and local administration continued to discuss, debate, revise, and implement aspects of the comprehensive project to develop popular libraries, 
um, an office of publishing, as well as a book wagons project. Yet an entirely centralized and evenly distributed system never materialized throughout Indochina due to economic crises, political insurrections, and a rapid turnover in political administration. Yet Bidet continued to organize circulating book wagons throughout the 30s and early 40s, albeit with fiscal limitations. Here, for example, is a photograph of a book wagon circulating secular and Buddhist texts from the Royal Library in Cambodia that was organized by another um, scholar administrator, Suzanne Carpeliz, the curator of the Buddhist Institute and Royal Library in Cambodia through the 1930s. Um, this book wagon pictured on the left circulated thousands of volumes throughout the Southeast Cambodia, Southwest Cochin China region. In comparison, the Cambodge Library, pictured on the right, was functioned more as the administrative archive and reference library. The director continued to organize these circulating libraries sporadically in the 40s, especially throughout South Vietnam, um, Cochin China region. A 1946 report argued that circulating libraries brought French culture to the outer isolated regions of Cochin China, which served as a healthy leisure activity. The report estimated that throughout 36 to 46, um, the circulating libraries brought more than 23,000 books to the provinces. In 1942, just to zoom in a little bit more um, to get a sense of the readers and the reader tastes, over 20, in over 22 provinces, as far as Chodok, Sokchang, and Hatian, participated in the circulating library project based out of the Saigon Cochin China Library. For example, the August 1942 borrowing list from the port province of Zach Zach. Uh, recorded 31 total borrowers for the month, of which two were French men, one was one a Vietnamese woman, and the remaining 28 readers were Vietnamese men. Most of the books borrowed were French popular novels, such as pop fiction on romance, police, stories, espionage by Delhi, translations of popular world literature, like the work of Agatha Christie, Pearl S. Buck, and Leo Tolstoy, as well as French language historical works on Napoleon, Caesar, books on science and geography. In terms of Quoc Mu Vietnamese language works, the materials checked out were instructional texts as well as new popular Vietnamese novels. As seen in this slide, these book wagon numbers point to what Peter Zinnemann has termed as a provincial cosmopolitanism, a popular global and French literature network in Vietnam. And my research adds to this analysis by highlighting the logistical movement of these texts into the countryside. Furthermore, the book wagon circulated, the circulation records show how the booming Vietnamese quốc ngữ print market of new popular literature, such as those by Vietnamese Southern writer Ho Bio Chan. My research on the bibliobus reveals how these new experimental forms of quốc ngữ literature, primarily produced in the urban centers of Hanoi and Saigon, extended geographically, moving and conceptualizing the Vietnamese reading public into the countryside. Another major argument that I advance is that the development of libraries was not simply a French initiated project, but involved a larger community of Vietnamese publishers, journalists, and literary figures who called for the development of libraries for the larger Vietnamese language reading public. In 1942, Quang Viet drafted an extensive program to create a Quốc Ngu library system throughout the three regions of Vietnam and published this four page essay featured prominently in the popular colonial periodical, Chi Thân. Kung Viet was the pen name of Saigon-based journalist and writer Lee Vin Kung, who had worked in the Saigon Library in the 40s, as well as participated in associations for the advancements of Guk Mu. In his essay, he directly draws a connection between the development of Guk Mu libraries and the advancement of Vietnamese civilization and collective identity. The first part of the essay establishes the pervasiveness of Guk Mu and the patriotic responsibility of each person in the country to serve and improve the language since it directly connects to the progress of the motherland, he quotes. Taking a closer analysis of his essay, as shown in this quote, Viet points to the importance of spreading Guk Mu works to the larger collective and uses a tone emphasizing the urgent necessity to think beyond the individual and towards the collective. Viet framed the library's project as a collective duty, he says. I have been able to superfluously enjoy these priceless spiritual nourishments. I must not be selfish and only enjoy these Guk Mu works for myself. I must do something so that my compatriots, less fortunate than I, who do not have money to even witness and see these valuable works of Guk Mu, can benefit from these books along with me. At the foundation of this project, Kung Viet outlines a collective uh, concept of the Vietnamese public tied deeply to the dutiful involvement of the collective public, or the Guan Chung, 
for the mass general benefit regardless of class, religion, and politics. The author subtly critiques existing libraries in Indochina, stating that private libraries of associations only permitted access to its members, while the state Hanoi Central Library made it difficult to enter and access its Kuk Mu collection. Kung Viet described his proposed project as a Kuk Mu library network with central libraries for San Hanoi, Saigon, and Hue, bridging into provincial libraries, and then a book wagon bringing books to provinces and villages. Furthermore, Viet argues that the preservation of Gunglu books are part of a project to preserve Vietnamese culture. In analyzing this important essay, I point to the relationship between individual and collective duty and how it intersects with the consciousness of the public and a sense of Vietnamese collective evolution, as seen on the bottom of the slide. Furthermore, Viet's argument and word choice emphasizes how the public work of building a library could also contribute to a broader cultural and national project of defining and preserving a sense of Vietnamese culture through book new collections. Viet proposed a circulating library or book wagons initiative, which would bring book new books and newspapers directly to distant villages and hamlets. Viet described this as a good popularization effort to bring the villager useful knowledge for the betterment of their lives. It's not surprising that the proposed project mirrors that of the existing directorate system and the proposals from Boudet, given Viet's experience working in the Saigon Library. Yet, so a lot of his model, his proposed system was modeled off of the existing state Hanoi and Saigon libraries. Yet, the proposed system distinguished itself from the state libraries due to its emphasis firstly on Gwoknu collections, and secondly, on the collective monetary investment from the wider Vietnamese public. Furthermore, Viet points to the cultural capital of the library as an appealing gathering place for the ultimate literary culture of Vietnamese educated youth, writers, thinkers, and elite readers. This project is significant because it points to how the creation of public library was at its foundation a collective endeavor tied to Vietnamese national community and responsibility of compatriots to cultivate, protect, and share that identity according to Viet. About a week after Viet's article, the journalist and scholar of literature and history, Hoa Bang, um, expanded Kung Viet's proposal to include building reading societies in the countryside. Also published in Ji Tan, the article, Gak Vung Ngoi O, Ao Thon Kwe Kan Yung Zuyet Thu Bao Sa, the city outskirts and the countryside need these reading societies, explained that existing library initiatives only serve a limited minority of urban readers, literate in French. The author also criticizes the Hanoi Central Library as restrictive given its linguistic focus on French material and thus limiting its influence to only a few and failing to provide a universal service to all. Building upon Viet's linguistic demands for more Guk Lu libraries, Bang also calls for development of these reading spaces beyond the urban confines and into the rural outskirts and countryside communities. Specifically, Hua Bang argues that cultivating reading practices had a moralizing benefit and thus should be universally applied across geographic reaches. Firstly, he notices how, how the creation of libraries supported good leisure and thus could offset bad leisure behaviors. Besides the promotion of healthy leisure activities, Bang emphasized that a reading taste must be cultivated for the good of humanity. You can see this in the quote here where he discusses reading books as an antidote to bad leisure practices, such as going to taverns. Building upon the metaphor of reading as eating, Hamang represents books as desirable food objects with attractive sense and spiritual nourishment in the second quote here in this slide. He notes how urban readers already have a certain addiction to this type of literary consumption. Hamang proposed that reading societies could be built in the existing temples of literature and shrines in the villages and hamlets. He draws heavily from Confucian values of scholarship and examination to argue that the inherent value of literature and reading honored through the creation of these reading societies. Quoting a popular aphorism among exam laureates that translates as, even if a child is stupid, they must still try to study and read literature. Hua Bang declares how proposed reading societies carry on the wishes of Vietnamese scholarly ancestors. Similar to Viet's proposal, Bang concludes his essay with a statement that the Guk Mu Library project ultimate benefits the public, the people, the Zen Zhong. He calls for the individual districts to sacrifice 50% of their budget used for festivals to contribute to the developing of these library projects. The Bibliobus Book Wagons project is significant because firstly, it situates the library within the landscape of print culture and geography of colonial control. And secondly, it points to the administrative exchanges 
between imperial projects and international library sciences. I reveal the differ diffuse negotiations and fragmented implementation of an official system to control the publishing and distribution of print through Indochina motivated by indirect propaganda. These projects to centralize print control emerge out of colonial fears of rising urban radicalism, as well as anti-colonial revolutionary ideologies. In comparison, Director of the Archives and Libraries, Paul Boudet, focused on expanding access to, quote, apolitical reading matter for the countryside through circulating book wagons. Boudet directly engaged with international current and library practices to bring good reading directly to the people geographically. Drawing from the US, France, England, the movement saw the creation of public libraries as the actualization of state commitment to its citizens, access to modern valuable knowledge and expansion of public services into the countryside. Boudet presented his book wagons project as one of vulgarization and benevolent modernization. In this way, the mission and everyday reality of colonial library carried this inherently contradictory ambiguous role. The library reflected state visions of control, modernity and power, Yet at the same time, the library advanced this benevolent mission of popular modern education, allowing for self-directed selection of reading matter and adapted to demands for public access. But most importantly, my close study of the Biblio Buds sheds light on the mechanics of book circulation and the literary tastes of Vietnamese readers in the provinces. I trace the mechanics of book circulation of Book Wagons Project and illuminate how Vietnamese readers engage with this provincial cosmopolitanism of reading global literature as well as Vietnamese new literary forms in the urban centers of Hanoi and Saigon. I uncovered the vibrant debates amongst Vietnamese intellectuals on the page of Jitan, who called out the failures of colonial state projects to provide adequate and equal library access to and Guoglu reading materials to the Vietnamese public, especially those in the countryside. These intellectuals propose a distinct meaning of the public rooted in a collective consciousness through the selfless act of building literary collections, specifically in Guoglu. This tied national identity to linguistic identity in Gukmu as the national language of the masses. Emphasizing the inherent value of Gukmu texts, Kung Viet and Huabang, defined Vietnamese good reading as a collective project that involved all Vietnamese, including those in the countryside, beyond the urban centers of Hanoi and Saigon. Good reading was not just text, but was a way of defining, modernizing, and uplifting Vietnamese leisure practices, spiritual influences, and intellectual nourishment. Furthermore, good reading and the preservation of Gukmu libraries contributed to defining a Vietnamese collective cultural identity and historical temporality from pre-colonial Confucian scholarly traditions into the present and into the future. So this excerpt formed a key component of my fourth chapter on the politics of good reading and print control. Um, in the brief remaining time, I'm just going to breeze through um, and zoom out a little bit on how this fits into the larger manuscript project. So in this reading um, as a book project, the chapters follow a chronological and thematic structure. The first focusing on builders, then the readers, popular libraries, print control, the excerpt I read today, and then concluding with decolonization. Each chapter considers the relationship between print control and the public, as well as thinking about the historical development of libraries as spaces of reading, education, and documentation. Uh, given this limited time, I'll just briefly discuss the scope of the first two chapters and last chapter. So, for example, in chapter one, I establish the history's vision and key personnel, the four central institutions examine the book, the Saigon Cochin China Library, the Hanoi Central Library, Phnom Penh Library in Cambodia, and the Directorate of Archives and Libraries in Indochina. I argue that French colonialism gave rise to new types of hybrid library institutions shaped by the changing politics of the colonial state and library standards of print control. I pay particular attention to both high le level labor trained in France and library sciences and bibliothèque economy, um, such as the, these sharp trained administrators in this slide, but I also pay particular attention to the training of Vietnamese laborers as seen in this slide. As a counter narrative to the first chapter on builders, this chapter focuses on library users and experience the Central Hanoi Library and Coach Chenna Library in Saigon. Focus on the symbolic and experience architecture of the library. This chapter sheds light on the ways that the library reader bodies were made modern. They're legible, quieted, restricted, and monitored. Specifically, I examine race-based restrictions to library access and regulations on popular, on proper behavior to demonstrate the contradiction of colonial Republican project to modernize 
through exclusion and racial hierarchy. Yet by the 20s and 30s, Vietnamese students became the majority of library users and subverted this colonial vision of the library as an exclusive space for French readers, colonial administrators, and scholarly researchers. I argue that the Vietnamese library users redefined the meaning of modern public space by contesting library reading roles, demanding reform and increased access, and reinscribing the actual and symbolic space of the library through everyday behavior. I continue on um, through the chapters to include with decolonization, where I examine the decolonization of this elaborate directorate of archives and libraries in Indochina, as well as the nationalization of the central libraries in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in Hanoi, the Republic of Vietnam in Saigon. I reveal how decolonization was this fragmented process embedded within the logistical movement of people, reading matter, and physically creating spaces, as well as the redefinition of colonial institutions in a post-colonial national landscape. So here you have a, a photograph of President Nguyen Diep inaugurating the building of this new ambitious national library project and cultural center in Saigon um, in 1956. And this is actually built on the former site of the colonial prison. So just to summarize, as shown in this visual uh, through the book, I uncover how the library is at the center of two intertwined processes, the development of the colonial state and the public. This dynamic history of the library in colonial and post-colonial Vietnam reveals a hybrid model of state libraries, which are constantly negotiating between different information systems, different visions of reading public, access and education, as well as the role of modern state institutions. So taking a larger step back and transitioning into Q&A, I just wanted to share what's been on my mind as I work through the book manuscript revisions and thinking of the library as this analytical lens. So I'm working on how the library allows us to understand larger cultural, social, and literary processes. So firstly, I'm, I situate the library within reading and print culture and reveal how libraries are important sites of cosmopolitan and textual exchange, as well as understanding the different historic processes of language learning and development of French and Vietnamese, and in, in ways that are part of the landscape of other spaces that are occurring during this time, bookshops, associations, clubs, temples, and schools, but also libraries are distinct because of the nature of how individuals read through self-selection um, and self-directed reading matter, um, as well as public reading practices in, in, in institutional spaces, such as in Hanoi and Saigon, uh, libraries. For the second point, I'm investigating the role of libraries as an institution of state documentation of its subjects and involving evolving bureaucratic technical practices. Here I seek to contribute new insight into the field of library science and information history, where I approach the concept of the library as both material repository and a set of technical, cultural, and social practices. And lastly, how I engage with my archival newspaper and literary source material is to provide a cultural history of urban public spaces and practices of public reading. Specifically, that means investigating and paying attention to the ways in which these historical actors are occupying or reclaiming space in ways that are often not intended by administrators. Um, thinking about these spaces as social or leisure spaces, idle spaces, how individuals seem to constantly be breaking um, breaking rules in the library, um, providing, being noisy, being disorderly, disrupting um, other readers, but also the ways in which the spaces are gendered and racialized. So I, I mean, that's, um, that's just by way of conclusion, which are the concepts that are evolving in my mind. I very much look forward to Q&A as well as just any other questions about my work um, and how it intersects with yours or as well as just meeting all of the attendees here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy Nguyen. Um, I will help moderate the Q&A session. Uh, so if you could please use the raised hand, there's already a couple of questions in the chat um, and then we'll queue up the questions. And if and we asked that, you know, if you could please um, go on camera and, and direct your question to uh, Dr. Nguyen. So first up, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Huệ Tâm Hồ Tài, um, who's dropped two questions in here um, for Cindy. So could you please raise your question, Professor, uh, Professor Hồ Tài? Um, well, I have quite a few questions because your project is uh, really interesting to me. 
the first one was, was the Bibliobus a project meant to counter specifically the influence of Vietnamese journalism that originated in the cities, but was spread through the provinces, um, especially after the wave of protest of 1926, 1927. Um, so uh, since the Bibliobus project seems to have been launched in 1928, was there, you know, the idea of countering these protests and the influence of young franco anamite trained you know, um, protesters uh, in the countryside. So that's my first question. And, and I hope that you, your work does address that question. Um, well, firstly, thank you so much for raising that question. Um, and and your, your book on radicalism definitely has informed and shapes a lot of my work. Um, so the short answer is partially yes, a large significant part of the, um, the description specifically from Iraq about um, urban intellectuals and um, even like the coining or the framing of radicalism and, and Bolshevik ideologies was very much a discussion about the specific response to, to uh, the influence of Vietnamese journalism and the protests in 26, 27. Um, so I say partially yes, because the other um, aspect of this project was that it was a continual large scale project involving many actors, of course, Pierre Pasquier and Virac, but then also several other, um, several other colonial administrators. And then um, the, the focus on looking at, um, at Indonesia as an example, um, or the Dutch East Indies as an example of, of how, to, how to elaborate and create this system to counter this um, was also kind of intersected and intersected with those protests, but also predated those protests as well, because there were initiatives looking at indigenous publishing since, since the early 20s. Um, the specifics of Iraq as, as he talks about the urban versus rural tension and, and sense of threat was definitely in response to the protests, but I just wanted to situate this in a longer history of thinking about indigenous publishing and forms of subsidi subsidizing um, and, and promoting different types of quote, politically safe texts and publishing. And then the second part of this, um, of the ways in which the project predated and expanded beyond the specifics of of these 26, 27 protests is in the role of Boudet, who actually had proposed the Bibliobus, the Book Wagons project since, since 1917 and then later since 1919. So he envisioned forms of at least distributing books and the mechanism of how one could distribute books by drawing from a more global library approach of looking at public libraries and book wagons that was stemming from from the American Library Association, sense of like rural libraries projects that were developed in, in America actually since the turn of the 19th century. Um, so then there's different initiatives that are happening at the same time. And I think that's why this chapter was, or this excerpt was so hard to parse through is that there wasn't one singular um, justification. And the justification is varied because Boudet, when talking to Pasquier, of course, like framed his book wagons project as one of counter prop, like ways of countering radicalism. But actually in practice, often he he was just discussing the ways in which how, how does one carry out this in the context of public libraries and more of a library's um, apparatus. Okay, anybody else wants to raise a question? Because I've got quite a few more. Um, since the Bibliobus was um, catering to both French and Vietnamese readers, um, what was the difference in the materials that were being circulated? With, for French, for example, were they mostly for entertainment purposes, you know, reading for leisure? Mm -hmm. For Vietnamese, was there a more educational propaganda element to it? 
I mean, how would we know how to differentiate and what, what was the decision-making process for you know, choosing what book to uh, carry to the provinces? Thank you so much for that question. Um, it's a really hard question to um, answer given the archival records, but how I understand it was that often, so the reason why I also discussed the, the space limitations in the Cochin China Library reading room was that there were only 44 seats and in actuality, um, the reading room was constantly full. Um, there were a lot of readers actually got turned away. So this is urban readers were turned away. Um, and the lending section was incredibly popular because of the limited space for readers to actually read in place. So often readers then borrowed books to read um, somewhere else, not in the, in, the, in the actual reading room. So my understanding is that the lending section is what then continues to be circulated into the, the provinces. Um, so these lending section collections the goal of the library was that they hoped that they would reflect larger um, kind of demands and reader tastes. So I think this is one of the challenges. And, and I think those who are in libraries, uh, work in libraries could um, speak to this as well, is that uh, libraries have two interwoven um, tensions. And I think you also quote uh, references to, which is the initiative to preserve or to conserve and to circulate. And at times those, could work hand in hand, but then if you are, um, essentially the more you circulate a work, the more they actually get just the books get destroyed and, and the more that um, you have to put more attention into actual like preservation. So they're, they're like a two interwoven missions. Um, and, then the, and then those, that mission basically underlies the quote unquote success of a library is that the library is extensively used really well, it's circulated really well, but it also preserves and builds a large collection that reflects um, certain collecting practices. And the collecting practices and philosophy of what to collect was in principle, um, very idealistic, reflecting this sense of, I like guess I was saying with, with Pablo Day, something that's like has collects all levels of knowledge as extremely comprehensive, reflects primarily, um, the understanding of what is considered valuable, which is modeled upon French notions of value. So that's a lot of classics, um, a lot of works, encyclopedias were collected as well, a lot of volumes. There was an attempt to build large collections of what was considered like the essential, the essential works. Um, at the same time, there were also other reflections of what was interesting, which is contemporary, more contemporary, um, materials that are published in Indochina in the actual print sphere. So that could be bulletins, that could be other periodicals. Um, and then the lending section to answer your question was then built off of more recent publications. Um, and often the collections policy and what circulated was often random um, based on donations, based on cheap editions of what is, is popular and thus that, is, that becomes cheaper. So for example, um, you have many editions of what you see as global bestsellers, such as uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, The um, Three Musketeers, seen as kind of pop, um, not high class, not high level literature, but uh, readily available. Um, and those end up being circulated much more readily and in the bibliobus because they're, they're cheaper and then there's many editions of them. All right, thanks, Cindy. Um, next, we have a couple of hands raised here and um, Paul Sarno was the first person that raised the, his hand in here. So please go ahead. Yes, I wanted to ask you, uh, I saw the, those beautiful colonial buildings that constituted libraries, especially the one I saw in Cambodia. I think it had a date 1924 or so. What, what's happened to those buildings and what's happened to the contents? And if you could start with the Cambodian structure, I'd be interested. Um, thank you so much, Paul. And this is where um, the Cambodian case is one that I feel very... Um, <laughs> Uh, regretful about mainly because I was supposed to do field research in the Cambodian library this past summer, um, but then I 
that didn't end up happening amongst many other things. Um, but from what I understand um, is that that actually the, so that, that building is now the, the archives, the National Archives of Cambodia. Um, and, and that is um, in that sense, it retained its administrative apparatus, but then, um, I mean, this is, this, a lot of this was like through conversations with uh, my mentor, Penny Edwards, and the importance of actually the need to do this type of work, because like during the Khmer Rouge, like this area, this building was, um, uh, of course, not used, but then like had other, uh, was occupied for different reasons from, um, and then some of the materials were either destroyed or, and, and at times actually destruction of library materials happens uh, due to neglect, not necessarily out of intention. Um, so a lot of the materials, as many of you know, who, who have done work in, in Southeast Asia, um, because of the humidity, because of all like the bugs and the insects, then get degraded quite quickly, especially because of the paper. So, so a lot of the materials are not in great condition. Um, the, the Cambodian case too is interesting because the attempt to build this elaborate directorate of archives and library system in, in the five areas of Indochina really was this aspirational aspect where, you know, the Hanoi Central Library would be almost like the equivalent of a national library and have these subsequent other headquarters um, based on the different pays of different countries. Um, so you have Tonkin, you have, uh, you have Annam, you have uh, Cochin China in the south, and then you have Laos and you have Cambodge, and they were supposed to have like their own specific headquarters. So the Cambodge case is one, the Cochin China Library is another, and the Hanoi Central Library. There were attempts to build one in Hue and in um, Laos, but then those didn't really pick up. However, the Cambodia case is interesting because there was two parallel major libraries that developed. The, the picture, that, that beautiful um, library that you noted that actually, um, uses um, more of a neoclassical style in terms of the facade. Um, this library that was supposed to reflect this administrative colonial library in Phnom Penh, but at the same time, uh, Suzanne Carpelez was working closely with the Buddhist Institute um, and the Royal Library, which had, which kind of predated the, the administrative library. So there were two libraries that were existing. One that um, the administrative library, which was primarily serving administrators, but kind of lost a sense of purpose in a sense, like it didn't have a, a full a public facing library function. It was more of a reference administrative, almost seen more like an archive for administrators. Um, and then um, the Royal Library then became, the Royal Library and Buddhist Institute was more as part of the vision to popularize uh, print and Khmer script uh, and part of nationalizing Buddhism, like that that was the initiative that like Suzanne Carpelez was deeply involved in and that kind of carried out through the lens more of cultural heritage um, as well as um, relig religious preservation and, and ways of uh, building a vernacular print sphere in Cambodia. So then there's like two library systems that are very different in Cambodia and I hope to continue to do my work and expand into projects in Cambodia just at this moment um, that's that's kind of my understanding of the institutional history. Thank All right, so next, <laughs> next up, uh, we have Eric Harms and then Al Lim and Michelle Thompson um, and also uh, um, Dr. Moulton Yan. Uh, Cindy Nguyen has agreed to go a little bit longer than the 1 p.m. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep those questions going. So Eric, go ahead. First, thanks, Cindy. Uh, this is just so fascinating, such interesting work that you're doing. And I just want to congratulate you on the project overall and for a nice presentation today, too. Um, when you mentioned about Paul Boudet and this idea of um, wanting to compete with the illicit reading material, um, you know, like the bibliobus and the library system in general, it seems, right? Um, it made me want to know more about the illicit materials. Um, and Hoi Tam already asked the question I was thinking of at first, you know, like about the journalism, but it also did open up another question I was thinking about, like, well, what are all the things that people are reading that are illicit and where are they getting them and how is it circulating? Um, because I remember when reading about journalism, one of the things I think in Hoi Tam's book actually, 
you know, Wing Ang Lim publishes La Cloche Filet, but, and it has a certain, you know, number of printed copies, but of course people are getting one copy and like 40 people are reading it or something like that, you know, a whole <laughs> bunch of people are. And so the, in a sense, it's kind of like a local library, like they're like a, a like a kind of bibliobus of the people, right? Um, and so I'm just wondering, like, what are people buying? Where are they going? What are the bookstores like in, in all this? Is, is there also regulation of what's sold in the bookstores and all of that? And so a general description of the reading public and other forms of circulation would be really great to hear briefly. Thank you, Eric. And I think this is where, um, this is very much deeply on my mind is how do I place the libraries within this larger ecosystem of print sphere? Because of course, individuals are reading widely from all these different sources from, as you noted, like bookstores, um, they're passing on the materials, um, they're participating in new forms of like serialized storytelling, as well as different types of journalistic practices. And I would also like to defer this type of work to um, with them's tremendous scholarship um, in this field as well, in terms of thinking about journalistic um, and radicalism as the ways in which it, journalism uh, and the different types of kind of print forms allow for these types of uh, political organizing as well as forms of literary expression. Um, yet, I think what is interesting about the kind of the libraries in this larger ecosystem is that it has, so there's, because of the ways in which libraries was organized, of course, it was funded by the, the governmental state it had this deeply archival preservation mentality of both collecting um, what was considered like works of value, but both based on the French notion of value. And then also there was a pre preservation mentality where not only was the library operated as the archives and as these public libraries, but also operated as the legal deposit. So that means that in principle, every work that was officially filed for publication in Indochina, one copy needed to be filed in the regional library. So if something is published in Saigon, it, one copy needed to be filed in the Saigon Cochin China Library. And then one copy needed to be submitted to the Hanoi Central Library into the Book Depot. And then one other copy needed to be submitted to the legal deposit in the National Library in Paris. And this is where with Sean McHale's work, where he analyzed a lot of the legal deposit works, that's how those collections were built. So in, in principle, that reflects a certain um, slice of what was the print, reading, production, literary, journalistic um, print production from like the 20s to the 40s during Vietnam. Um, and, and Mikhail has pointed to like how it shows cases a lot of like Buddhist um, writing material, for example, um, as well as um, kind of other forms of literary um, genres, uh, satire, um, and then satire as well as like fiction and things like that. Um, however, what's interesting when you look about the materials that are in the library, so you have this like the, these books of which are considered quote unquote classics. And then you have these new forms of Indochina published materials, um, new as in um, things that are contemporarily printed re rather than retroactively preserved um, and how they differ from what is basically sold on the streets. Um, and it's, it's not always a blur, like a distinct um, separation because some of the most popular works, as I was saying, make their way into the library too, because there's just so many copies of them, they end up getting added into the library because of its popularity. However, there, there was still, the library acquisition still went through a process of somewhat um, of um, indirect censorship, which is that those of which was not seen as, uh, was seen as more political or, or radicalizing than, and it didn't end up in the library. So it's, the other material that ended up kind of in circulating in, in bookstores um, and, and being retranslated or rewritten and republished in different editions. Um, what's interesting as I, I, I have lists of things of which are, books of which are ac uh, kind of accidentally end up in the library of which shouldn't have been there, which is really interesting because then it kind of points to that this regime of control was much, weaker than we anticipate, that which is often the, the case. So for example, uh, Gwynne Van Vin translated uh, Rousseau's social contract 
and that circulated in the library for quite some time. And it wasn't, it was debated as to like how risky or dangerous these works were, but then it kind of, when it was found, it was immediately pulled from the library, for example, or there's other like biographies of Chinese nationalists. So I think those are like, that's a quintessential example of, of the illicit reading of which is circulating. And that also uh, was, ended up in the library and then immediately got flagged as well. There were also initiatives to start like smaller libraries and to officially open a library and, and have it um, recognized by the state. Um, you had to publicly post what the library, even if it was like an association, you had to publicly post what materials were in there. Um, and, and often, so then the, the colonial state is trying to police these cases of like these illicit libraries that are opening without official registration. And then it's often um, lists of, of these either like biographies of revolutionaries that are circulating, uh, a lot of political tracts, um, criticisms, explicit criticisms of the state, I think pretty um, like overtly anti-colonial texts and those libraries immediately tried to, were, were shut down or policed. I realize there's so many questions and I hope, is there a way that I could also save the chat? So feel free to please also um, yes, throw so There are in some the questions in the chat and then um, let's see in the participants, uh, Al Lim has also raised his hand. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. It's super, super fascinating to hear about. Um, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about Anderson and national identity. I, I love the kind of quote from the article thinking about civility and the connection between linguistic and national identity. I mean, I even think that print culture is that alternative to print capitalism that Chatterjee kind of critiques. And so thinking about print culture instead of capitalism as a much more nuanced way to think about kind of like national identity and formation. Um, and I'm wondering how successful were libraries as part of articulating national identity? So in, in so much that they do, how do we measure its success, especially I, I guess with the decolonization chapter? And one way to think about it, I love that you mentioned that Lao, for example, didn't have a library. So how did they, for example, articulate national identity as part of um, without um, a kind of um, equivalent library? And then also thinking about how folks are like colonial authorities have different agendas. So they're trying to like, um, articulate a kind of forceful kind of like imposition of certain things versus like borrowers who are like borrowing books and not necessarily thinking about national identity in that way. So it's just um, a lot of, I guess, a lot of moving parts. And I think to Eric's previous question, this idea about repression, like censorship, like a Foucauldian take is like, the more you repress, that doesn't really work in that way. So the more colonial people try to articulate national identity, that ends up kind of working in very different ways. So I'm just wondering, how do we track kind of that relationship between yeah, nationalism and, and libraries? Thank you so much, Al. You've asked well, many layers of questions of which I, I hope to um, be able to answer or articulate um, in different ways. So as a, as a brief answer, one question um, that I'm working through right now is that was actually taken from the, this close analysis of this Kung Viet piece is the connection between national identity and linguistic identity. Um, and this is something that underlines so much of my project, which is as I'm tracing the history of the libraries and thinking to Eric's question, even Huygum's question about like what makes the library kind of different in this larger ecosystem of other books is that um, the story of the library in Indochina is also the story, like has, I would say two other intertwined stories, which is one on education and two on language. And I would argue that, especially thinking about decolonization and like, let's take the specific instance of the Cochin China Library um, of which underwent extensive processes of decolonization in the 50s and then but in 54 to 55 um, with the division of North and South Vietnam, it, uh, the Saigon or the Cochin China Library inherited a third of the French colonial collections in Hanoi, as well as all the staff and the University of Hanoi. So there were all these colonial um, institutions that then were physically, logistically moved down to Saigon. And then um, Saigon, the Cochin China Library, this tiny already cramped library inherited this collection. And it wasn't just a, like a physical merger, but um, from, from the fifth, actually really earlier from like 45 to, and especially through 49, the Cochin China Library, as it was going through this process of decolonization was trying to articulate how 
how do we distinguish ourselves from our colonial past, but also we are inheriting all of these colonial vestiges, French language materials, for example, a lot of materials about in the archives about the colonial state. Um, so how do we distinguish ourselves as a, as a Vietnamese nation? And this process, as we understand through um, studying the Republic of Vietnam and also through the war was constantly trying to distinguish itself from, from North Vietnam too, which is that the South Vietnam and, and Saigon was, was, was trying to articulate itself as this, as this national um, cultural heritage preserver of the legitimate form of all Vietnamese identity. And, that, and this is where I argue that the library played a very key part in this. So because it inherited all these, these colonial materials, it also um, sought and advocated that this was part of its mission was that we are preserving this long history of all of Vietnamese history, um, kind of symbolized through inheriting, inheriting this, this collection, inheriting actually um, some of the pre-colonial collections that were also preserved in Hanoi. Um, and then additionally, looking into the present and to the future, which is that we needed, as a library, needed to advocate and, and transform language acquisition or like the acquisition of materials in Vietnamese rather than in French. So there was, there was a huge shift um, to, to nationalize the library through the collection of adamantly searching out and, and adding all Vietnamese materials that were published, newly published in the 50s and 60s, as well as building collections like Chinese language collections as well as part of the Saigon Library. Um, and, and this is where kind of going back to your question of how does one articulate kind of this national identity, I would argue is, is very closely intertwined with these, these language policies, as well as the library, um, especially this case of the Saigon Library, symbolically functioning as this, this fort, like I think the quote said, the, a fortress of culture um, and for, a fortress of culture and heritage that really articulated a national identity, kind of looking forward, but also looking to its past, right? So looking to preserve and create this kind of uh, streamlined understanding of what was considered le uh, legitimate Vietnamese national identity. Um, I think I'll stop there because I could keep going with this because it's such a fascinating way of framing and thank you so much um, for that question. Great, we have Michelle Thompson next. And then after Michelle, uh, Dr. Ngo Thanh Yan. Hi, this was just really a wonderful talk and I was very happy to see it on the schedule because it kind of connects with some work I did earlier on what gets put into an archive and what does not. I was focusing mainly on GNOME. I originally had several questions for you, but you've kind of addressed some of them in the, the question and answer period. But one thing that, that hasn't been touched on, but just was just barely brought up in your, your answer just a minute ago, is connected to staff. And there's a wonderful novel I read a few years ago, and I'm trying to remember the exact name of it, but it's about a woman in the early 20th century in the United States who fought to get to be allowed to be a part of the staff of a library in the Appalachian Mountains who was delivering books to people on horseback. She literally had a route, like a mail route that she covered like once every couple of weeks or so. It's a really great novel. But, you know, I thought, I, I would just like to hear you talk a little bit about the staff. I mean, we don't, you didn't really say anything about say gender makeup of the staff or, you know, effects on them, uh, effects, of them on their own communities, et cetera. So I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the staff of these libraries. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you brought this question up. This was like the subject of my one of my other talks where I just talked about the people. Um, so, so tracing the, the librarians and the staff is was um, a very complicated endeavor because there was frequent turnover in low-level staff. And, and this would include from like secretaries, copyists, typists, um, groundskeepers, those who are maintaining security and operations of the building. But I, I think what's fascinating about in, in a lot of this discussion about the staff and the personnel and, and extensive record keeping about the personnel is that um, there was this, there was this uh, kind of vibrant, world of librarian low-level staff who are who were the primary readers of the library because they work there they checked out the books the most and you see this especially in the Saigon library and um it's in these because there'll be 
um, they'll be the ones who are constantly, uh, they'll be in the book checkout records. Uh, and then they actually, because they work in the library and end up um, kind of defying the, the restrictions of like only checking out two books at a time, they need to check out four, for example. Um, and then um, in one of my chapters in, in the 1930s, there's an extensive discussion about how high level staff, which are primarily French trained. So at either at Chartres, like that's at the highest level um, of the administrators as like the director of like, for example, the Saigon Library, and then the lower level librarians um, either that are French, like racially French, end up um, coming into the library, either working from like other administrative or governmental offices. Um, so if they're not officially trained in library sciences, then they are trained in other governmental work. And then you have um, Vietnamese, um, librarian staff who either have come in because they've, uh, I think in uh, like Hong Viet technically worked in the Saigon library before and he actually um, was very much involved, I think uh, with them pointed to this too, but involved in other literacy societies like Guk Lu popularization societies. Some are involved as um, as like self-taught linguists, um, they're, they have like a scholar bureaucrat type of identity. Oh, but then the discussion I was talking about was like in the thirties, there was this rampant extensive discussion between tension between high level staff and low level staff because there were often accusations um, against low level staff for stealing books because they have the most access to the library collections. So they, the low level staff were often seen as suspect from high level staff um, and yeah, so that they and then were dismissed because of other um, tensions or um, kind of um, how would I describe this as kind of disconnects between different working cultures. Uh, so, for example, people showing up late or people kind of defying the library rules, coming on weekends, coming when it's closed. So, so using this space in ways that weren't intended. So these are library staff like living in this space, like uh, after hours, not leaving, bringing in their friends, <laughs> like thing, things of which were, were seen as, as defying a very kind of rigid policy of library preservation um, or, or kind of not being as attentive to like recording checkouts, for example. So I have a lot of these, what I saw see as these, these everyday dramas of library staff um, amongst each other, but also tensions between, like I have a case, for example, of a French reader in the Noi Central Library who, um, who, who basically uh, physically attacked a low-level Vietnamese librarian because that librarian would not bundle up his books that he checked out. Um, so then the French administrator, or the French reader patron um, punched the librarian and then the librarian staff ended up like reporting this to uh, higher administration, but then there was no kind of type of like consequences for these this type of, of behavior. And then that really points to kind of the racial hierarchies within reading of these these um, of, of the libraries. So I have so many of these stories, Michelle. I think it's just um, it it really I'm trying to still make sense of them just because it um, they're so nuanced and textured. Um, oh, and then the other one I wanted to mention also is gender, is that the majority of the library staff were, were male um, and low level were definitely racially uh, Vietnamese, but then um, often the discussion about hiring Vietnamese librarians, or sorry, a female librarian staff was um, seen as a question also of, it was race and gender questions because it costs more to hire a female, a French female librarian, even though, and then a lot of French female librarians ended up being secretaries, but then um, over time, because of the costs of paying French administrators or French uh, library administrators, there was a shift to train more Vietnamese administrators. Um, uh, and then the, the, those were ended up often being male. Oh, are you, I think I think I'll end there because I could go into another story about Suzanne Carpelles, but I think I'll I'll stop here. Okay, and we'll have time for maybe one, one last question uh, from Dr. Ngo Tan Yan. And if you still have questions for uh, Zinyuan, please drop them in the chat, and we'll share those with her later.
this, this is a question that relates to Michelle, because uh, classification, there are a lot of classification in the library, and some of them are pre-classification. That, mean, that means acquisition, and then uh, the classification in Vietnam is very complex through uh, the Russian system, and then um, through the through American system, the D-Way system, and the Mac 21. I am uh, doing a lot of uh, um, village uh, documentation, and then uh, it, uh, it will be uh, like uh, to bypass all of that and then to go directly into a computer is uh, to, to library uh, online is uh, probably have to go to along with a library uh, organization so that uh, they don't have to, uh, to fire staff and then uh, and if the staff feeling that they are fired, then they, they would resist on change. Oh, that that is one of my question, and uh, I hope to know that uh, what kind of classification we use in, in in the libraries in Vietnam and Cambodia. Thank you so much I, um, for this question. You definitely, you're pointing to um, the complex information systems that were used over the different over the, the colonial and the post-colonial time. So during the colonial period, they followed the Bibliothèque Nationale, the French model of classifications, um, and then this this was thematically organized as well as so there were two catalogs that were used: one by theme, by topic, and then one by author. Um, and then these cataloging systems as the libraries continue to grow, it, it wasn't always updated. So like the author catalog, for example, was definitely not updated as much and it kind of fell apart. So often um, the classification system during the colonial period was, was in principle modeled that way, but then in practice, a lot of the, there were also other aspects of the, the library reading room where there were books of which were on the shelves for free perusal. So often these were like more like reference encyclopedia as well as contemporary periodicals that were available. And then there were separate lending sections which operated their own kind of, and these are collections of about 10,000 works. And these would operate with a, a, a theme um, or topic oriented catalog and then uh, author catalog. Um, what's interesting is by the fifties, um, there was an attempt to implement the Dewey Decimal System as well, as well as to put the um, Saigon Library more within kind of international library standards. And then at the same time, as you're, you're mentioning as well, is that um, the DRV in, in, in Hanoi, the library then was um, directly using the Russian, the BBK, the BBK um, classification system that um, followed like, uh, well, so Soviet as well as socialist notions of information organizing. So I believe I haven't looked at the classification system in a while, but how I understand it is I think the first three are like Marx, Lenin, ways of which are like, are more about like socialist forms of knowledge and information. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, and, and now how I understand it too is that, gosh, I think the last time the old card catalogs were still usable in the Hanoi the National Library in Hanoi because it followed the, the former cataloging system from, from the French period, then there was a process to put them into this, the socialist system. And then after that, now it's, it's going through another system of which it's, it's having issues because of, of um, putting it into the catalog. But I, I think, you're right in, in pointing out like the layered ways in which these classification systems actually um, create this, this disarray of the documentation um, and, and, and point to kind of also the different organizing or intellectual um, processes that underlie um, organizing information during these, these different historical periods. Thank you. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you for all these wonderful questions and Cindy for answering them. That will wrap it up for, for the day. So please join me in thank you, uh, thanking Cindy Nguyen for this amazing and fantastic uh, project that she's had done. Thank, thank you, Cindy, you so much. What great questions, thank you.